Well, folks, why don't we get started just a little bit slowly because it's the only way I know how to get started. And uh, my name is Jim Malamed. I'm one of the founders of Mediate.com and was the CEO for 25 years until uh, we hired Colin last year and Claire is right there uh, helping him along the way. And, and we'll hear a bit more from Colin and Claire in just a moment. I want to welcome you to this, the fifth of our six online mediation training forums where we're really trying to better understand all the different facets of the move toward online mediation and its implication for online mediation training, uh, whether that training is to do online mediation or face-to-face -face mediation or even uh, allied services. Uh, in fact, this particular forum is focused uh, on our allied professionals. Uh, and I'll get into that just a bit more in a moment. Um, I do want to highlight we have one more forum next Friday, uh, which will be led by Claire and Jonathan Rodriguez regarding issues for schools uh, and youth uh, regarding online mediation and online mediation training. Uh, at this moment, I wanted to toss it to Claire and Colin just to fill in uh, any administrative or technical uh, details that we should mention. Sure, you bet. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'll let Claire take it in a minute. Let me just speak to a minute to interpretation. Uh, we are very lucky today to have interpreters into both Portuguese and Spanish. If you have ever used interpretation before, you know how it works, but in the bottom of your Zoom, there's a little interpretation option, and then you can pick your preferred language. So uh, if you just leave it as is, or if you pick English, you'll hear all the English communication, but then if you prefer to hear the Portuguese translation or Spanish, you can pick the other languages. Um, I'm not sure how many Spanish speakers we have today. Maybe if you do want Spanish translation, if you could put something into the chat, uh, Vanessa is going to be providing our Spanish translation. Um, so thank you so much and feel free to chat me directly if you have any questions or challenges. Uh, Claire, do you have anything else that you want that we, we need to add in? Maybe I'll just uh, uh, take the initiative to say we do uh, very much appreciate conversations in the chat, and uh, we actually save the chat and share that with the recording as well. So if you have comments or thoughts or questions, please don't hesitate to put them into the chat. We're going to be putting links, as you say. Uh, Jim just put a, a link to his intro slides as well in the chat. So uh, please don't hesitate to ask any questions and, and we'll be monitoring the chat and responding there uh, in parallel with the presentations. Um, so Jim, why don't I hand it back to you? Good, so thank you so very much. I'm gonna do another quick screen share uh, if everything cooperates. And I think so. Uh, Brian, can you give me a thumbs up if you see my slide? Thank you. Very good. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to, in a moment, introduce Woody Mostyn, who will take over the uh, hosting and introductions. Uh, I think we talked about all the technical pieces. I do really want to highlight the importance of the chat in the sense that we, we're, we're uh, memorializing it, we're sharing it. If you want to be sure that an issue gets considered, raise it in the chat. Uh, that's a part, you know, it's, it's a parallel conference, if you will. And uh, we can also benefit one another by providing answers and resources and the like. So let's have the chat dimension be as rich uh, as it can be. Uh, here is the talent today. Again, uh, I'll be introducing Woody and then Woody will be introducing the other stars that we have lined up for you. Um, the main reason I distributed the PDF is there's just lots of links on this document that may be convenient Note the main task force website at mediate.com slash online training. There's a forums header there. Um, I note that all of the video recordings of the first four forums, as well as the written resources are all posting on, posted on those respective forum pages. Uh, Woody has been the wonderful task force chair. We've had an 11 member executive committee. We got a 28 member task force. You can read more about these folks if you click on their names. We got 11 task force committees. 
And uh, here is the overall forum schedule. Uh, and the piece I wanna mention now is that all of this is ultimately in service of trying to develop a helpful report uh, that would really assess all of the opportunities for mediation and affiliated uh, professions in the online environment and try to answer the question of how we as a field, dispute resolution field, can now most capably respond. And it's not just with regard to the online mediation services, but specifically with regard to the training of mediators and dispute resolution professionals. Now, it's not just the services that have changed over the last year, all of the training that has taken place has also been online. So here's the first, the, the three quick things that I'm hoping for. Uh, one is uh, they say a wise person learns from the mistakes of another. And so I'm, I'm wanting to know what we can learn from all of our allied professionals. What are, what are the things that you've learned, the, the, the hard lessons that we've learned online? Um, how can we best integrate uh, online mediation and mediation generally with allied professionals? I am just so stunned by our ability to, in a very nimble, strategic way, set up meetings with exactly who we need on a conversation and to talk about a specific topic and to really get the job done in a very strategic and very efficient and tailored way. And so I'm really intrigued, particularly the ability to bring in advisory council or mental health professional, financial professional, you name it, uh, reviewing attorney uh, right into a meeting for as long as necessary, but not necessarily longer then it's helpful. And then finally, uh, the question is, what are the implications for online mediation and online mediation training? We, we now have a enhanced ability to communicate with anyone anywhere about what we need to talk about to get the job done. So how is this now gonna change the services uh, and the training uh, that we're all offering? So that is plenty for me. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Woody, who has really been a champion of this effort and has wonderfully coordinated the dozens of other professionals. We're now just getting to the point uh, where we'll be receiving committee reports, we believe as of June 15th. Uh, we'll be doing our very best to integrate an effective executive summary uh, with uh, both a report and recommendations moving forward. And then we'll, we will be hosting another forum, presumably in July, where we will be rolling out uh, this report and having interactive discussion about it. So Woody, um, I'm gonna encourage you to unmute yourself. And I wanna thank you so very much for your wonderful work on this project. Jim, thanks so much. This. Um, not academic. This isn't theoretical for me. This is a personal, very personal forum. And um, I just, before introducing the panel, want to give a personal and historical look at some of the uh, issues that will be uh, discussed uh, in this, uh, this particular uh, forum today. Um, the first, the first real issue is that to be a peacemaker, you don't have to be neutral. That peacemakers work with one side all the time. And a difference today is that instead of being mediators, there are a number of roles that we as peacemakers can play. So I have to make a confession that over the years, I've had an imaginary friend um, named Marion. Um, this uh, friend could live in Sao Paulo, in Anchorage, Alaska, in Bangladesh. My imaginary friend has a peacemaker heart living in an adversarial conflictual world. And somehow we're trying to be able in today's 
online world to make some conversion, some opportunity, <coughs> pardon me, to make a transition to a more peaceful uh, world where conflict abounds. Now, I want to take you all back to 1978, and it's a role that you may not know that I served. I was a, an assistant regional director for the Federal Trade Commission, and we studied real estate brokers who were trying to unbundle their services to let people sell their own homes. And brokers didn't like that. And about 13 years later, there was a, uh, a movement to have a form of legal access. And that form was called legal services, unbundled legal services. And meanwhile, on that road, there were people who had interdisciplinary partners in their offices, and they were interdisciplinary teams. And it's kind of morphed into a very different world. Professor Julie McFarlane has been a leader of this with her seminal book, The New Lawyer. And unbundled services are now throughout the world as an attempt to give people a new look opportunity to reduce their fees and have more control over their life. And from the unbundling and interdisciplinary approach, coaches have become commonplace mediation coaches, conflict coaches, life coaches, people who help one side begin to see their world a little um, uh, clearer and find both their self-interest and, and be able to go across the table. Uh, I'm very proud to say that one of the newest forms of this uh, uh, evolution is in British Columbia. Sonali Sharma is kind of a pioneer where she has led her group into unbundling collaborative practice so that while there is an interdisciplinary team and there are disqualification agreements, they attempt to make unbundled services much more affordable by each of the professionals limiting their scope. So this has been a, um, a worldwide effort and uh, today's panel are going to go into depth trying to take that work to the next level. And it's my pleasure to introduce them. First is Patty Porter. Patty comes from Texas. She is co-chair of the Beyond Mediation Committee. She's been in conflict management for 27 years, mediating workplace issues. And um, her, she began her conflict coaching practice in 2003 and is an accredited senior trainer, coach, mentor, competency, competency assessor, of conflict management coaching. Sam Imperati comes from Oregon. He is the executive director of the Institute for Conflict Management. Sam has been resolving complex disputes, facilitating public policy issues, and mediating multi-party cases since 1992. He's also a trainer and offers workshops across the country, has been included in the list of best lawyers of America for dispute resolution from 2006 to the present time. His career is legendary, but it is his wit and sense of humor that's most memorable. <laughs> Annie, pardon me, Amy uh, Skogerson comes to us from Iowa. She is an attorney 
mediator, educator, and consultant. She is founder of The Law Shop, which is the first law firm to exclusively offer unbundled legal services uh, to her clients. She is an expert in unbundled legal services and has become a leader to help show the world that by offering limited scope services, one can increase the access to justice, improve the well being of both clients and lawyers. She was recently featured in an article by the ABA highlighting her le leading edge approach to legal services. Adam Cordova comes from Tampa, Florida. He is a leading collaborative lawyer, mediator, and trainer. He serves on the board of directors of IACP and chaired many committees and task forces of this international collaborative organization. He's presently chair of the IACP task force, considering changes to the IACP ethics and standards in regard to an introductory trainings. I'm probably most proud that Adam is my co-editor and co-author of an American Associ Bar Association book on building a successful collaborative law practice, which was published in 218. And the heart and soul of this, of this committee is its co-chair, Brian Galbraith, who hails from Ontario, Canada. Brian is a collaborative lawyer, mediator, and trainer. He is the owner of an incredibly innovative law firm of 15 lawyers, all practicing family law. Brian serves on the board of directors of the IACP. He is presently serving as its, as its secretary. Brian, I'm very proud to say, has two chapters in the book added, edited by Adam and me. And um, Brian, Please take it away. Hey, our uh, first presentation will be uh, uh, by Patty. So Patty, go ahead. All right, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Woody, for that great introduction of what our committee is doing. So everyone, welcome. I first want to acknowledge that Cindy Noble, who was going to join us today, was not able to. She is the founder of the Synergy Conflict Management Coaching Model. I appreciate her contributions to today's presentation, so I will be including both of our comments uh, from the six questions I'll be addressing. So on the first slide, the first question, what is conflict coaching? So conflict coaching, we also call it conflict management coaching, is a one-on-one -on -one process in which a trained coach supports clients to strengthen their conflict competence. And this includes building their confidence and their comfort in how they engage more effectively in their interpersonal disputes. A lot of times clients will come in because they want to prepare for a mediation discussion or some type of facilitated dialogue. And so coaching can be used to prepare clients for these types of conversations. So that is what is conflict coaching. We'll go to the second question. Who are our coaching clients and our training participants? Because we do uh, the services and the training aspect. So for both Cindy and myself, most of our clients are going to be leaders within organizations, public, private, nonprofit, uh, also higher institutions, higher education institutions. However, the process applies to any context in which the client wants to improve or gain increased ability to manage their way around conflict. We get a lot of family mediators who come into the coaching courses who are working with family issues, couples wills and estate issues. And of course, we deal with a lot of workplace uh, matters with the clients we work with. The other thing that there are different entry points into the conflict that people come into uh, for coaching. We think of it as before conflict, during conflict, and after conflict. People who come into coaching are either self-referred or are referred by their leadership. In terms of the before conflict, uh, this is usually a difficult conversation uh, that somebody wants to prepare and have. They want to be able to address the issue so that they can preempt any kind of unnecessary conflict. So they'll come in to think about how do I do this? What's my messaging? What's the best approach? 
during conflict, they're already in the interpersonal dispute and it's derailing. They're, they might be in a toxic cycle with each other and they want to either manage the dynamic more effectively or certainly get off what we would call the not so merry-go-round of conflict. If it's after the dispute, it could even be after the mediation, um, they want to look at, um, you know, what did I learn from that situation? What could I have done differently? Maybe how do I figure out what's the best way to proceed? Sometimes they want to rebuild trust in the relationship. So there's a number of things the dispute is long past, but they're still agonizing over. And finally, another set of clients that come through conflict management coaching are those who want to change their conflict habits. For example, I will typically get people who are conflict avoidant in their general realm, and they want to have a stronger voice. They want to be able to speak up. They want to maybe manage their triggers better so they're not reacting in aggressive ways. Uh, they want to communicate uh, differently when they're in conflict situations. So they're looking at a longer term behavior change, uh, thinking and how they think about conflict. And in terms of our training participants, the kinds of training participants we get in our conflict coaching courses are a variety of uh, coaches, life coaches, business coaches, financial coaches, all kinds of coaches, all kinds of mediators from all backgrounds. Uh, we get a lot of family mediators and, of course, workplace mediators. Uh, HR, we get a number of ombuds from internal organizations, especially a lot of universities who have in-house uh, ombuds. Uh, they are very popular in our courses. Of course, your, uh, lawyers, union reps, leaders in organizations. We also get the, the realm of mental health, psychologists, social workers, and therapists. So those are the typical training participants we get. So the third question is, what are the differences in how we work with clients and training participants pre and post COVID? Well, for both Cindy and I, there has been not a lot of difference in the services we provide for coaching clients Cindy, who began her coaching in 1999 uh, uh, in person, but also she started offering a lot of telephone and Skype for her international uh, clients. I began in 2003 and I was using the same method, but I started also using WhatsApp for international clients and Adobe Connect. And I've been using those for uh, many uh, years. So Really, with the pandemic, uh, no, there was nothing counterintuitive for us. Uh, we did have to learn other platforms. I, I had not really used Zoom. Uh, I had not used Microsoft Teams. So I did have to learn some of those modalities. But pretty much, it stayed the same. Um, the one thing we want to say about the services end is that not all clients want to be seen. Uh, they only want to be coached, and they tend to reflect better when someone's not looking at them during the coaching conversation. So we continue to offer uh, both our, our phone coaching or we turn off the video. So not really a lot of difference uh, pre and post COVID in terms of the client services. Now the training, a little bit different. For Cindy uh, in the early 90s, her coach training was mostly by phone uh, because there wasn't a lot of accessible platforms available at that time. And coaching schools were really wanting to reach students around the world for training. I started my conflict coaching training after I trained under CINE starting in the mid 2000s. I conducted my in-person trainings. They were typically four day in-person trainings. And I was also uh, converting it to virtual platform using Adobe Connect. And then since the pandemic, it's been exclusively online using Zoom. Now, one of the things that I have found with online training, and especially with the pandemic, is I've seen an increase of training participants um, from really all over the world. By opening it up online, uh, we've, we've seen people who would typically wouldn't attend because they, or would attend because they couldn't afford the travel budget, they didn't have the chuck of time to take a whole week off from work or family obligations. We've seen a, a very big surge in international students. I've had students from Russia, South Africa, Israel, Ireland, Poland. But what that also means in my training is I had to be much more culturally competent because we were training the model from a westernized viewpoint, but then we had to take into some other considerations, cultural considerations in how the model fit 
uh, from a gender uh, standpoint, uh, from uh, other different cultural norms that we had to deal with in terms of some of the coaching skills. We also had to learn how to deal a little bit more with high and low context communications uh, when we were training. So we really had to take in more of these cultural considerations that we had not done before uh, when the online training uh, created that surge in international students. We've also seen, I've also seen um, an increase in people with disabilities accessing the online training. And what's changed for this is it really had to be, make me more aware of what to do to make the online training accessible. We'll talk about that in the preparations piece, um, but I, I did wanna mention that. And it also for me afforded me opportunities to use more certified coach mentors from around the US and Canada and other countries that we might not have been able to do in an in-person training in terms of travel budget bringing them. This has now really allowed me to access coach mentors from around the world when I do these trainings. One of the differences um, we've all seen and we've all experienced is the video fatigue. And because people are now on Zoom, on all these virtual platforms all day long, the way we were delivering our trainings, we had to really take a step back and think about the format of the trainings. And so the process design, do I need to add more asynchronous activities outside of class? Do I need more breakout activities, more reflection time, more time for networking? Uh, we've shortened our live training segment. So we've had to really rethink some of that to reduce some of the Zoom fatigue that people were experiencing. So we've over the last year been experimenting with different delivery formats, everything from holding the courses uh, in four weeks, six weeks, seven weeks time. We're now adding video recordings for asynchronous activities. But overall, we plan to continue uh, teaching online and even going to a hybrid format, both combining in-person and virtual um, as things begin to open up. So I think we're now into the fourth question, Ryan, which is what, prepa prepa what preparations occur with coaching clients and training participants? For the most part, the coaching clients remains the same. Nothing's really changed. We continue to send foundational materials, coaching contracts, uh, pre-coaching questionnaires to get people prepared for their uh, coaching conversations with us. In terms of the training, because we are accredited with the International Coach Federation, there's very certain guidelines and rigors to making sure the online training meets those competencies and requirements. So here's something that's changed a little bit um, since the COVID's happened. Now we were already sending course materials in the mail in advance um, to the students, whereas typically we'd, we'd give it to them in person. But during COVID, mail services were suspended they were extremely slow or they were very expensive to mail. I had a, a student from South Africa and I went to mail her materials package and it was going to cost me $200. I said, thank you. Please give that back to me. <laughs> I am not mailing that package. And it come to find out they had stopped services in South Africa for mail and they had not been receiving from mail for almost three months. So then we were like, okay, we really need to think about sending these materials electronically. How do we protect copyright? So there was a lot of uh, technology issues around the safety and the, uh, and the protection of those materials that we were sending electronically. The other thing that we do is we use a lot of coach mentors in our work. So they're assigned to students prior to the first day of class. If we were in person, they just show up in the in-person class. Now we need to coordinate. We assign the students. The coach mentors have to schedule with their students. their are eight hours of practice outside of class time. So there's a bit of coordination there that's going on. We also, in an online environment, have them do asynchronous self-study activities, reading, watching videos. So that means now... I'm spending more time getting ready to videotape uh, demonstrations, intake, coaching models. And then I'm also learning like, how do I make them, how do I use closed captioning in Zoom? How do I use closed captioning in PowerPoint? Do I make American Sign Language interpreter to interpret the demonstration? So these are all new things I'm having to do, especially as I consider disability accommodations. Uh, I just talked to another student this morning who wants to attend the class, same class, and he's blind. 
So then I was just like, okay, what do you need? So now I have someone who is from the deaf community and now someone who's from blind. And so we're talking about, you know, con converting text, um, you know, to, for them to be able to learn. All right, so let's go into the fifth question. I'm hearing a lot of a lot of static, Brian. I'm not sure where that might be coming from. It, it, it's over now. Okay, thank you. So I'm on the question number five. What don't we like about online coaching and training? Really, there's nothing we don't like about it. Uh, it works for our clients all over the world. In fact, our local clients will often want to use online sources for a variety of reasons. So uh, there's nothing that our clients don't like about that. Um, most of our clients have some kind of access to technology. Sometimes there's inequities on how they access it. So there's a lot of education, uh, an education curve around using some of the technology, uh, but we build that in, in in helping our clients use that technology. In terms of the training, I think one of the biggest things that we do miss is the in-person interactions. Um, you know, it's those, those things you chat in the, you know, during the lunch hour, we go to dinner after class, people get to know each other in a different way. So we've had to take that into consideration with our online training and think of how do we build in those kinds of activities where everyone gets to know each other in some form or fashion uh, during the in-life class session times, because once they're out of class, they're in their own small little group and never to be interacting with other people. So we really have to consider our training design to making sure people are connecting in other ways during the training. The last question, which is one thing we as mediators can learn from our experience during COVID. From Cine's perspective, um, in thinking, we've, we've all had an opportunity to rethink how we deliver services and how we teach and how we connect. And so for Cine, her biggest takeaway is that we as a field are resilient and able to adapt to change in circumstances to serve our clients well, despite the pandemic. And for me, you know, I've been part of Colin Rule and Dan Rainey and Jeff Oresti's world for a while now. I've learned so much about the ODR field for many years. They've been leading that field. They've been the thought leaders in that field. Uh, and there's many, many more dispute resolution practitioners who are way up there in the ODR field who've been educating us, guiding us, uh, de you know, developing best practices. So this is really not new. But it took the pandemic to move the rest of us into this realm, whether we liked it or not. And so as mediators, we need to think about embracing change uh, to serve our clients um, local. Excuse me, my alarm went off there. Um, we need to really think about embracing change to serve our clients local and afar because we're having access to more and more people across the world. We need to be agile. We need to be open to future possibilities with curiosity. Put resistance aside. Being outside of your comfort zone allows you to grow as a professional and supports the field develop in directions we did not think possible or even feasible. That is the end of my conflict coaching segment. I'll hand it right back to Brian. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patty. And I appreciate your comments. So we're now going on to uh, public... Uh, policy facilitation, and that uh, will be led by uh, Sam. Uh, thank you, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and greetings. Uh, Woody um, referenced my sense of humor, and that is what we call in the field a trigger warning uh, to uh, get, get an advance of, of what I might say. I appreciate you warning the audience. As my son says, I'm an acquired taste that few want to acquire. So I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to use some humor uh, today because I believe while I take this subject very seriously, I think people learn better when they can smile in between. So we're going to cover. Uh, these six topics, what is public policy facilitation? How is it different than mediation? How did it evolve? How did we, how we did it and currently are doing it? Uh, uh, what will keep post pandemic and then give you some resources. So next slide, please. 
So what is public policy facilitation? Here is a spectrum done by the Policy Consensus Institute that uh, that's, is in Portland State University and its affiliate, the Oregon Consensus Program. It's a continuum from left to right. On the left end of the spectrum, you have uh, cooperative, informal, unassisted, perhaps um, inexpensive and low intensity. Uh, parties come together and try to informally work out their dispute. On the right hand of the spectrum are administrative court decisions, judicial courts decisions. They're adversarial, they're formal, they're assisted, they're expensive and high intensity. So we go from uh, informal processes uh, on the left hand to more formal processes where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth on the right hand of the spectrum. In between is the world of public policy facilitation. And that's where policy dialogue and roundtables and forums are um, created by sponsors of issues and organizations and facilitators come in and help. There are facilitated collaborative problem solving. There is mediated negotiation of disputes and there's negotiated rulemaking. So think of these processes as large group processes where everyone is watching and we as public policy facilitators are assisting in that middle of the spectrum going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So how is it different than mediation? Um, I think mediation and public policy facilitation, we're all cousins, we're all part of the same umbrella appropriate dispute resolution or ADR form. Uh, for those of you who want to dive into the real nuances between these professions, um, you can look at the codes of ethics. Um, I've always believed that when analyzing what we do and don't do, um, to look at the various codes of ethics is telling on how the various professionals in each of these fields define themselves. So on the left is um, the mediation core standards from the Oregon Mediation Association. There are 10 of them. Um, on the right, it come um, from the International Association of Facilitators. There are eight of those standards. There is a lot of overlap, but mediators are more ethical because we have 10 standards and facilitators only have eight. So therefore, uh, consistent with the 10 commandments, we are more ethical than facilitators, paren, attempt at humor, and paren. So really the concepts of self-determination, informed consent, partial regard exist. One of the major distinctions is the lack of confidentiality in facilitation. Most of these uh, facilitated matters do not enjoy statutory or contractual uh, confidentiality. And that is a big distinction. But because of the constraints of time, um, the other nuances of this I'll leave to you to explore by going at, to the various links. Next slide, please. So uh, in Oregon, uh, mediation by statute is defined very, very broadly. It's a process when it, in which a mediator assists and facilitates two or more parties to a controversy in reaching a mutually acceptable resolution of the controversy. So look at the interesting choice of words. Mediation is a process in which a mediator assists and facilitates two or more parties. So the words can be considered interchangeable, except that at least in Oregon, you are mediating when there's a confidentiality issue, when there's a controversy, which means it's confidential. If there's not a controversy, then you are facilitating and that controls whether or not we have confidentiality or not. And that then speaks to the levels of protection we have to ensure as mediators, given the core role confidentiality places in our processes, which are not present in facilitations. So uh, under the world of facilitation, um, the distinction is 
um, academic that there's no controversy, otherwise it would be a mediation. But I ask all of you who work in these uh, uh, related fields, how many times does a client call you up and say, hey, I really want to hire you to assist this group or the public. They're getting along perfectly. Everything is fine. It's Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa come early. Uh, could you, could we pay you hundreds of thousands of dollars to help this group? No, they call you because there is a controversy. And so when you're mediating and when you're facilitating, um, it's an important distinction to know uh, what you are doing in the ramifications surrounding client expectations and confidentiality. I also suggest that you consider our other cousin, IAP2, the International Association of Public Participation. There are two links on this slide, which will be sent to all of you um, at the end of this presentation. But they are also involved in the providing of resolution type services and the soliciting of public um, input on issues that governmental entities are uh, looking for public input and advice on. So it is a process of encouraging exploration versus debate. So mediators, International Association of Facilitators and their cousins IAP2 all come together um, in this cross field collaboration to help people make better decisions. Next slide, please. So how did it evolve? It started in the 1970s and 80s, and it was really more about public involvement, where the participants of these particular areas were telling people what a governmental entity was going to do. It was akin to just simply advertising and giving folks a heads up. In the 90s, there was a shift towards prevention and against political and legal pushback. So it became participation versus involvement, where we not only told folks what we did, but we also asked them for their opinion going forward. In the 2000s, we looked at collaborative governance. And this was collaborative problem solving where the entire array of stakeholders were convened at one place and one time, always in person to explore recommendations to the ultimate decision-making body. Uh, in the 2000s and 10s, we moved to, I think, competitive governance or mediation versus facilitation and pretend public participation. And what do I mean by that? I mean that what happened is there are usual suspects that attend these public policy facilitations, stakeholder groups that always seem to be at the table. They learned how to game collaborative processes for their Machiavellian interests. That isn't a criticism as much as an observation that it made collaboration more difficult to bring folks together. It became more like a negotiation than an exploration. In the 2020s, we started to take these things online, obviously because of the pandemic and superimposed on uh, that change to online environment became the talk of racial and social justice in the context of impartiality. So the issues surrounding what a mediator and facilitator did started to be questioned as to whether or not the, uh, the so-called neutral and partial third party should maintain impartiality when it came to a racial and social justice issue, which has made, more difficult, made a more difficult conversation, more challenging from a technical perspective. Next slide, please. Brian, thank you. Uh, so question four is, how did we do it then? Well, pre-pandemic, we, we mediated. So you couldn't tell if you were just dropped into a room other than the size of the room and the fact that the press was present 
and that there were 20 to 30 people in the room. What we actually did was the same techniques and tools that we do in mediation. But the difference was it, it was in person, it was a public place, there was no confidentiality and everyone was watching. All our handouts were printed materials. We used flip charts. Um, what we did to break impasse and shuttle diplomacy was working the breaks, by which I mean we would go back and forth between the various participants at a break, chat them up, see how they were doing, float a proposal for going forward. We would intentionally seat people that were in opposition next to each other around the table uh, so they could talk informally and develop informal relationships. Um, we lost that ability uh, for that um, uh, efficient informal relationship building since we went offline. Now everything we're doing is electronic. We're using more surveys that, uh, that are electronic surveys in real time. Back in the day, we paid little attention to cybersecurity. Now it's which virus are you referring to, the, the uh, uh, COVID or the vi computer viruses. Back in the day, we were able to read all non-verbal cues. Now we're limited to just reading faces and vocal changes. It's become more challenging. Back in the day, we went to folks as opposed to inviting them to go downtown. Now we have access via technology as becoming an equity issue, an accessibility issue. Back in the day, we did uh, synchronous uh, facilitation. Now, sometimes we are forced to do asynchronous training. I'm using the word synchronous and asynchronous simply to appear more sophisticated and erudite because I haven't been to a conference in the last year where those two terms haven't been used as opposed to real time and not real time. Next slide, please. So what are we gonna keep doing? The question of doing this work virtual is not a matter uh, of if we're going to do it at this point. It's simply a matter of how we are going to do it at this way. We're gonna to continue to do these public policy matters using mediation um, in addition to facilitation and public party facilitation. We're now gonna use a combination of in-person public place and Zoom with YouTube to get wider audiences. We're gonna have a greater use of electronic handouts, virtual open houses, and small group Zoom breakout rooms. There's gonna be more pre and post formal session one-on-ones uh, versus working the breaks in between these meetings. We're gonna spend more meeting time spent, formal meeting time spent on building informal relationships where we were able to do that offline. More attention, obviously, to virtual security. We're going to get by bigger and dual monitors, and it's going to be Zoomorama. So what are some helpful resources? Uh, IAP2 has a great resource, uh, virtual work and the new normal online meetings, online public engagement tools, and resources to help you stay connected. Let's learn from our brothers and sisters in other fields. The American Bar Association is having a dispute resolution tech expo coming up in July. There's the link there. If you want one book to uh, look at engaging virtual meetings to avoid Zoom fatigue, I suggest engaging virtual meetings by John Chen. You can get that on Amazon. Uh, I want to thank you. Uh, feel free to contact me. And I close with a picture of the person I most want to be like when I grow up, Father Guido Sarducci from Saturday Night Live, where he taught us in five minutes what the typical graduate remembers five years after graduating. So go forth, do good, avoid evil, and I'll turn it back over to our next talent, as we were called. <laughs> Brian, you're muted.
I'm uh, just saying thank you very much, Sam. Now uh, we're on to Amy, please. Thank you, Brian. Um, can, Brian, can you just give us up the okay? Can you Pardon hear me? me all right? I can can hear you, you hear me okay? Okay, yeah, we're good. Okay, just want to make sure. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Amy Skogerson. Sometimes I go by AJ, either one is fine. Um, so I am uh, I'm kind of a follower of Will of Unbundled Legal Services. Uh, he inspired myself and my partner, uh, Andrea McGinn. We started the law shop by Skogerson McGinn LA in 2017. And what started off as um, two solo attorneys with no staff is now five lawyers and three uh, staff. And we really have a lot of room to, to grow. We could actually expand, but we're trying to grow very cautiously to make sure that, um, that we do so in a wise manner. So um, I'm here to talk uh, just briefly about the legal services and maybe what we can hone from uh, them that in terms of working online. I also say that I'm going to trim my comments to be pretty short because I think we're a wee bit behind schedule and I want to make sure that you hear from Brian and Adam fully. So um, real briefly, just uh, what it, what are bundled legal services or what is limited scope rotation? Those are kind of used interchangeably. And at the law shop, we actually say that uh, that means that it's choose your own adventure um, for our clients. Essentially, we take cases or transactions, we break them up into parts and pieces, and we give clients a variety variety of options for how much legal estate they feel that they want or they, as well as uh, what, at what cost. So we do this right now for family and juvenile law, um, real estate, elder law, or tenant issues, occasional debtor creditor matters, and actually most recently even a little bit of criminal defense. So um, instead of having clients walk into our office and say, well, this is the kind of case I have, and we say this is how much money we need up front so that we can do everything, we have a discussion about what case is really going to um, need or in involve and allow the client to choose where they'd really like to have us inserted into the case because we can make a big difference even on it for a few minutes, and that's what our judges have, have said as well. So clients have the ability to choose from various options ranging from a single or a service bundle um, to uh, which might be uh, child support worksheet preparation or settlement agreement drafting. But one of my personal favorites, aside from actually acting as a mediator, is actually serving in the capacity of just mediation counsel. So I'm with the party purely for purpose of mediation so that they have someone there in Iowa and in our particular area, we do almost strictly caucus style mediation with lawyers present and agreements get signed at the end of most mediations. And so, um, so I like to be there with someone who maybe they don't want to spend the money on or they don't have it, but a lot of times they just don't want to spend the money on everything else. They want to put it where, it is. and so they uh, have us do some mediation representation. Um, we also have some drafting only services to um, traditional representation through um, through settlement. Very intentional. If you are an attorney and you've never thought about cutting off your representation sometime prior to trial, I highly recommend it. It's wonderful to have an intentional pause conversation with that. Um, and we, of course, also do collaborative divorce, a non court team approach to divorce with a multi, we have multidisciplinary team members, including a mental health professional, uh, at least one, and a financial neutral. So clients can mix and match their options that we offer. They can switch from one to another, services, more services later, if that is something that they uh, desire or need. And um, as we do this, some of our services are on a flat fee basis and some of them are on an hourly basis. It really just, just uh, depends on what they choose. So with regard to question two, how has working digitally impacted how we work with clients? Well, we are really unique, uh, at least in Iowa for what we do. And so we have a very high volume of clients. We are involved in cases for shorter amounts of time so we can handle a lot more and that means that we've attracted clients from a much larger geographic area because people really um, are looking for something like this so for this reason um, we were already actually doing some client meetings online using zoom uh, prior to covid but certainly covid amped that up um, i had wanted to increase our um, digituses already but really mostly for selfish reasons because i like to travel and i thought that it would free me up a bit more but the problem was the rest of the world wasn't as comfortable with it as I was until COVID. And now it is.
So we've actually become pretty much an entirely online service for clients. And we, in I would say March of 2020, we really haven't had very many clients at all in the office other than for will signings and an occasional real estate closing. What we're finding from this is how has it changed us? Well, meetings is faster since there isn't any time spent greeting up taking them to the off into my office, getting them a cup of coffee, those sorts of things um, are kind of gone because the client is handling those, of course, on their own. Also, since mediation is an unbundled service that we provide, we've gotten about sending documents that uh, relevant mediation it out in advance using digital software sorts of things. The only really significant change in our firm since we were already set up digitally has been an intentional increase in a lot of our in for how we process cases to minimize of our brief discovered extra time. I say be briefly discovered because of course we snapped it right up as soon as we found it. Uh, so I'm you um, question three here. <clears throat> Use technology to ensure working with us digitally is efficient. And this is definitely my favorite question for me today because uh, I'm not necessarily super techie, but I love organization and I love efficiency. So I, I find that anything, anytime we can use technology to increase productivity in our firm, that makes for happier clients, mind paying for their services who also has new clients and that's more money. And that's not a shame, it's good for everyone. So that, so among the top concerns for a particular to offering um, unbundled services is something called creep. And I can't say that that was our term, that scope creep. My understanding is that term was actually first coined by Elizabeth Potter Scully, who was Woody's co-author for one of his books on unbundled legal services. We love that term and use it often. And what it means, scope creep refers to what's, what happens when an attorney agrees to work on a client's legal matter on a limited scope basis, but the client ends wanting or needing additional services even though those services are outside the scope of the original services agreement. And so um, I become really anxious about this because they are seeing dollars being lost and they of course to run their firm. And again, there's no shame in that. That's something that we talk about regularly, but those are anxious and they perceive presume when they're worried that a client's going to perceive or presume that the attorney's role is larger than we agreed and they don't want that kind of scope creep. Um, if, for example, that starts to happen, then we need to take a pause and talk with them about, okay, we need a new services agreement. I'd be happy to help you with that. Here's what it costs and here's a new agreement, more paperwork. So with the digital work that we do, we've become very, very efficient at having a process for how that's handled. In fact, even as to who handles it in our office to make sure that we're not losing billable time with having some of that extra, um, extra involvement required for a limited practice. Um, and sometimes Sometimes that's for those are uh, we have requirements for additional paperwork by ethical rule or by rule of civil procedure, but sometimes it's just it, frankly, I would say it's just a best practice. So even if it's not required in your state, it's a, it's yeah. So those extra steps, though, can create a lot of lost billable time if not handled efficiently. Since we do unbundled services, that means um, pre-COVID, like I said, we had developed some processes for how we talk with clients about what, and we had also developed paperwork for that. But now with that all to be digital, we're utilizing a lot more technology, um, not just in the sense of using platform Zoom and, and off Teams and all those, but also fillable PDF forms. Uh, and we're in the process of actually expanding our website quite a bit. Utilizing email templates, if you haven't discovered them, by all means, please, they're amazing. Uh, sending out links for online payment in advance, as well as perhaps most important, is that we do weekly team huddles every morning, every Monday morning. And those may be in person, they may be online, or they may be a hybrid. Is that it's important that we make sure we keep up to date on where we are at and what any kind of new in anything new we're adding to the process. Because our team has grown, we need to, of course, make sure that everyone is on board with that. So finally, I'll just take another minute or two to cover as far as pros and cons of providing unbundled services digitally. I really am not finding many cons. Patty say that earlier, and I would agree. Um, I think once we adapted, there just really are no negatives for the most part. 
Um, the only one I could think of, I do a lot of things, uh, training for unbundled legal services. I'm also a mediation trainer and a little bit of collaborative training. As I do those, the only thing I feel we can't replicate online is the opportunities for social interactions. Um, so it, you know, these seminars and events, we've traditionally had dinners or dances or, uh, just fun activities. And, and that's a bummer that we can't totally recreate online, but everybody's creative way. So I think we'll get there. Um, but in terms of positives, online unbundled practice, uh, definitely far greater flexibility for client and attorneys in terms of location, travel. Um, I love that I could practice from anywhere in the world now. Uh, I'm saving a lot of dollars on the little stuff, paper, coffee cups, even cleaning services at the office. Um, it's easier to support eventual service sharing with our attorneys because of the fact that they don't really have people coming in and out of their offices all the time. Uh, there are ways to still stay connected as a team. And I think that's one of the biggest things we need to watch out for is that it's important we be uh, minding our P's and Q's and doing everything properly online with our clients, but we don't want to lose the connection of our team. Those relationships are incredibly important as well. Um, so yeah, I, my findings here are really that uh, an all digital practice for Unbundled is uh, far more efficient and that we certainly have in person if that really is needed. Um, that's not going to go away, I don't think. But for the most part, I think that what Sam said is that the digital practice is here to stay. Um, so it's really more how are we going to adapt. So I guess I would just close by saying that... Um, <laughs> Thank you, Woody. I think I'd just close out by saying that use technology to your advantage. It's pretty cool, all the things that we can do and how easy it is to do these. I am, we provided, uh, every one of the papers for today provided Woody with additional information that I believe will ultimately be shown. In that, I did provide um, the uh, to where you can purchase that book by John Chen on engaging virtual meetings, as well as a link to some technology that I personally use from a laptop stand, which is wonderful uh, to get your camera to lighting to microphone, um, all those sorts of things. And uh, I think that I will hand it over to Brian and Adam. Thanks, Thanks so much, Amy. Hey. Um, I think um, unbundled services are terrific because on the one end, you have full representation, and on the other end, there's no representation, and unbundled services can provide assistance in between, uh, which we never had in the past. And I think it really creates a greater access to justice when someone can uh, get the help of, uh, of you and your, your colleagues. We do uh, both document creation and coaching where we're coaching people uh, uh, in the background, but we're not a solicitor of record. Uh, and uh, it, 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 uh, it's a great service. So thanks for sharing us with us. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, collaborative practice. This is a process to resolve family law conflict without court. So each person has their own attorney or what we call in Canada, a lawyer. Uh, but should the matter go to court, those attorneys are disqualified from participation. And this is, this changes everything. And because the attorneys now have a vested interest in settlement, they are no longer coming to that settlement table with the plan of how to get set up for litigation. So it changes also how we look at the law. Uh, in litigation, we see the law as the sun in the sky and everything rotates around it. But in collaborative practice, we saw the law, see the law as just another star in the sky. And one con uh, item of consideration that the client should uh, take into uh, keep in mind when they're resolving their issues. So it's a really fundamental change in the, the process when there's this disqualification clause from the attorneys going to court. We become settlement specialists. It's also an interdisciplinary process. So we engage a, a neutral family professional, social workers, psychologists, and so on, other mental health professionals who help with the emotional journey and they, they uh, coach the clients through it to be their best selves. They facilitate the meetings and uh, they help build a, a parenting plan as to 
uh, the, how the, the two parents will work together on parenting. We also engage a neutral financial person uh, professional who works with both parties uh, to, to exchange the financial disclosure and to uh, uh, discuss and resolve all the financial issues and uh, the support uh, issues. So, uh, so the, the team works together. Sometimes we have full settlement meetings where there's both clients, the family professional and the financial professional all together around the table, all working to find a way to settle the cases. Uh, Woody mentioned that uh, Adam and I are involved in the IACP. That's the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals. And it's, it's the international community of legal and mental health and uh, financial professionals who are working to create uh, uh, client-centered solutions for, for their members. We have uh, almost 3,000 members in 25 countries uh, around the world. And the, the pandemic has been hard on everyone. It's been really hard, but I'll tell you what, for the IACP, it's, been a, it, the, it's benefited this association in the sense that we've seen people come to collaborative practice in droves. And who mostly I think it's been attorneys who have been sitting at home, the court system is stalled, uh, they're not able to help their clients resolve issues and they, they could see that collaborative professionals were very busy, uh, just uh, their plates were uh, very full uh, because they were able to continue to function even though the court system uh, had been stalled as a result of the pandemic. And so we've seen uh, huge numbers of people trained uh, all around the world uh, as uh, people flock to this uh, process. One thing that I wanted to share with you is the, the mission statement of, of IAC, and that is to, to transform the way families resolve conflict by building a global community of collaborative practice and consensual dispute resolution professionals. That's all of you. We want you all to be part of our community. And that's been a, the, an interesting transition that's been taking place in collaborative practices. There seems to be a greater convergence, convergence of mediation and collaborative practice. Many, uh, I would say most of the collaborative professionals are doing mediation as well as collaborative practice. Because uh, we're all pulling in the same direction. We're all uh, kindred spirits working to help uh, people find solutions for their family law matters. It's been interesting because what we've seen is the convergence since Adam and I and a, another colleague, we last year presented on three different models where mediation and collaborative practice have converged into kind of a hybrid system. And we, we're seeing uh, uh, it, Jacinta Galland is a mediator who will sit down with the parties, begin the process as a mediation, and then bring in collaborative attorneys uh, and other professionals, the other neutral professionals, to create this mediation collaborative kind of case. And we see collaborative professionals who bring mediators in to help uh, when, there's, when, when there's impasse. And so it's so wonderful to see us all working together. And that wasn't always the case. I know uh, 25, 30 years ago, uh, there was uh, the mediation community was kind of worried that collaborative practice was the competition. Well, we're not the competition. We're all in this together. We're all working arm in arm to help uh, clients find a, a better solution. So uh, when the pandemic hit, yeah, we, uh, we had to change quickly. In our office, um, it was a pretty easy shift because our office, of uh, we have 15 lawyers. Uh, we do have worked remotely for many years. We've been paperless for many years. So I put on a, a workshop and uh, we probably had 400, 500 people uh, see this workshop done by myself and my colleague at Russell Alexander uh, in March or April of 2020 about how to work remotely. And it was so wonderful because the collaborative professional community, it, for many of them, they'd never uh, done anything remotely. Everything was in person, 
everything was around the table, uh, everything was on paper, and now they were they were scrambling. But boy, uh, IACP and other organizations put on some great workshops, and soon people transition into using Zoom. That is the primary platform in collaborative practice, I would say, is Zoom. Uh, people are using DocuSign. They're using uh, uh, various systems to save documents like uh, Box and uh, Google Drive and so on to exchange documents online. And people are learning uh, how much they can run their practice off their phone if, they, if necessary. And uh, it pivoted quite well. We've, we've seen clients who are having Zoom meetings. If they're in the same house, one will be in their car and the other uh, in, the, in the basement and the, they'll still be able to have those, those meetings. So in the early days, it was all about protocols. How do we, how do we manage uh, the, uh, these meetings, these settlement meetings on Zoom? And uh, so we had to set up these protocols and we had to manage the technology, uh, but it, it went quite smoothly and uh, uh, worked very well. So what's next? I, I think we're, we're looking at revising protocols going forward because I think we're going into a transition period where we're gonna see a lot more hybrid meetings that people, someone will, will wanna be on Zoom, someone uh, will wanna be in person. And so we need to develop some protocols around those hybrid meetings. You know, what do we do if the Zoom connection ends? Uh, will we just terminate the meeting or continue? And how will that work so that people feel that they're they're being heard throughout the process? Uh, so that's I think the next step for uh, collaborative practice is to to look at those sorts of things. The other is you know may for the little while there may be uh, people wanting masks during those uh, in person meetings and others not. Maybe social distancing will be something some will want and others won't won't feel a need for that. So we're going through this interesting transition phase now. And we're, we've, so we've got a lot of discussions to have to, to determine what we're, how we're going to do this. So in, in our province of Ontario, we have a, a technology committee and we're, we're actively looking at this, trying to develop some protocols that we can share with professionals uh, throughout the province uh, uh, for this next phase of, uh, of our practice. So uh, I, I see the future as continuing to be on Zoom. I think uh, it's worked quite well. People have been pleased with it. With it. The people have, who were hesitant uh, with respect to uh, its efficiency have come around and found that it's, it's pretty good. Uh, I think, you know, there will be a group, a, a percentage that will will clamor for in-person meetings. And so I think going forward, we're going, we're going to have a combination of things. I think we're going to continue to have an online existence and an online process. We're going to have hybrid uh, processes and we're going to have uh, uh, in-person. You know, Colin Rule talked about virtual reality as being a, a thing in China in the judicial system. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that will be coming to collaborative practice soon. So uh, now I'd like to pass it on to my good friend and colleague, uh, Adam, who will talk about what went on with our training community uh, at the international level. All right, Brian, thank you. And thank you for that explanation for, uh, of collaborative practice. And actually, Brian, can you take down the, the PowerPoint slide? Uh, stop sharing your screen. Um, and, um, all right, there, there we go. Now I get to see some of your beautiful faces. Thank you um, uh, for, for being here today. And I'm kind of curious by a show of hands, raise your hand if you yourself are a trainer in some discipline, raise your hand. All right, see quite a few and please feel free to uh, put in the chat the discipline in which you're a trainer uh, because love to, to see that. And also raise your hand if you had a training canceled last year because of COVID-19, raise your hand. Yeah, so, so quite a few of us. You know, sadly enough, last year in March, 
I was scheduled to have a uh, training with Woody. He was going to be coming here to Tampa Bay, Florida, so that we could train on building a successful collaborative family law practice. And I got a call, uh, it was either late February or early March, and Woody, Woody said, hey, Adam, I really hate to say this, but I don't feel comfortable getting on a plane. I think we're going to have to cancel. And that, that was devastating. Um, I, I so love working with Woody. And, and it just, it couldn't work out. And rightly so for safety reasons, it should not have gone on. Um, many of us have experienced that. As a member, as the uh, former chair of the Standards and Ethics Committee of the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals, we started getting calls from trainers because the IECP has minimum standards for trainings. One line in that minimum standard is that they have to be in person. These were developed years ago. It, it notes in there, it has to be in person. The idea being that collaborative practice introductory trainings are supposed to be bringing people, uh, beginning their path towards a paradigm shift. And the thought when they were drafted is that virtual or other trainings would not permit uh, people beginning a path towards a paradigm shift away from traditional lawyering and traditional family law towards the more collaborative approach. But at the same time, we couldn't have trainings. Everything was being shut down. You couldn't gather in person. So we got more and more calls. Um, I then started you know, discussing with some colleagues, well, you know, what should we do about that? And still there were some who said, well, you can't do the paradigm shift online. There's really nothing we can do about it. Others said, well, this will blow over. Give it a, a month or two and we'll be fine. And we can, we can rejoin our uh, in-person uh, trainings. That clearly didn't happen. And um, ultimately I got together with um, Ann Lucas, who is currently the president of the IACP. And we created a task force of experienced uh, collaborative trainers, including Brian, Nancy Cameron, and others um, to answer several questions. Number one, can there be introductory trainings that would help professionals begin the path towards a paradigm shift? That's number one. If so, um, are there temporary standards that we can be, that can put in place, we can put in place in number three, and um, ought we consider changing our standards permanently to allow for virtual trainings? Um, after much discussion and back and forth in the meeting, we decided that the answer is yes, with the way technology is now, with the way you interact, the way um, you have Zoom to allow for breakout rooms and chat and other, other ways to interact. Yes, people can begin the path towards, uh, towards a paradigm shift virtually. And so we created temporary standards allowing for it. Um, but this was kind of the beginning. Some of us, we had worked on Zoom before, but we really hadn't been involved or even attended much training, long trainings on Zoom. Um, the introductory trainings require a minimum of 14 hours of training. Typically that's done two days in a row, a Friday and a Saturday, or a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, and we had to make the determination, was that, was that possible or practical? Um, what, um, what, uh, uh, standards shall we have in place um, so that people are not just staring at their computer screen for eight hours at a time. We had to make some decisions. Um, how flexible should it be? How many guidelines there should, uh, should it be? And the discussions began that, hey, we should have very narrow parameters um, because we're really afraid of Zoom fatigue and other things as well. Um, and we included some requirements like you can only have three live hours per day. There has to be at least a 15 minute break um, every 90 minutes or so, and some other requirements as well, just so that people weren't putting on, weren't taking their in-person two day trainings, eight hours per day or seven hours per day, and just plopping it online. And we got some pushback, but we announced that and people started doing trainings. They started doing trainings in different ways. Some people were doing trainings so that um, three hour sessions were happening once a week for five weeks. Others um, were doing several sessions per week and so on. And people were trying flexible, different flexible things. Then we decided to ask, uh, get the whole collaborative training community involved. 
and um, asked them, how's it going? What's working, what's not working? And we had a, a session uh, to get their feedback and we also sent out surveys and we got a lot of great responses. The overall response is, we love the option of online trainings, introductory trainings, and we want it to stay. That was pretty much unanimous. Um, but we were getting some pushback. Well, we wish we had some flexibility allowing for some longer time or, or other things, um, other options too. And so we've now gone through our third draft of our temporary standards. Um, and we just recently approved a new draft, which says, okay, now we're experienced uh, trainers doing these trainings virtually. And you can now have a lot more flexibility in how you offer it. Um, and, um, and so we just adopted those new temporary standards. We're gonna see how it goes. And we hope by the end of the year to change our permanent standards that at a minimum allows for virtual training. So um, even once this pandemic is over, uh, there's going to be all types of people who wish uh, to get trained virtually rather than travel or, or do it in person We've had people, typically, we used to go into a community, physical community, 90, 95% of the people would be from that community. The last training that I had, I think uh, there were people from eight different states and the province in Canada, all throughout the US, um, really has allowed more options, more opportunities for people to experience collaborative training virtually. So uh, that's, uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, that's all about virtual collaborative training. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the wonderful thing about the online training, I think, has been the accessibility of it, that there, we've had uh, some people participate in a, a remote uh, um, uh, First Nations communities uh, in Ontario that they said they would never have been able to, to do the training, but for the fact that it was online. Uh, we had a, a much greater diversity of, of um, pe people participating, uh, uh, young mothers who uh, could take three hours out of the day uh, and uh, manage their kids were, who were online and so on. It, it worked, worked really well uh, for so, much, so many more people. And, and of course, it, the cost was significantly less instead of having to pay for hotel rooms and restaurant food. Uh, they could sleep in their own bed and eat out of their own kitchen. So there was sure a lot of advantages to that. So now we're just going to uh, uh, put everyone into a breakout room because we really want everyone to have an opportunity to share what, you, what you've learned. And in the breakout room, there's going to be four questions. I'm just putting the four questions uh, in the chat right now. Uh, but your uh, each one of the presenters will facilitate uh, a, a breakout room and they'll be asking you all to help give them input on these four questions so uh, that you can participate and, and give us your insights. We'll be in that breakout room if it could just be limited to 15 minutes, uh, Colin or whoever's managing it, uh, that would be great. And then we'll come back and uh, uh, Woody will um, facilitate a discussion among the presenters about the highlights of their experience in the breakout room. So great. Uh, please, please join us in the breakout room. All right, I'm opening the rooms now and uh, I will try and distribute the presenters one in each room. Okay, the rooms are now open. So please feel free to join your rooms. Okay, welcome back everyone. So uh, Woody, you take it away. So, we all could feel the vibrance of those Zoom rooms. Let's start with Adam and um, find out what were some of the best practices that were that were highlighted in your room. Sure. And um, so we um, so one of the best practices was confirming that each participant is able to access the technology and is comfortable with it prior to mediation beginning. Um, and in, in so doing, this actually gives you an opportunity to build rapport with the client earlier than the mediation itself, um, because oftentimes it can be a bit more difficult to build the rapport 
in a virtual setting if there hasn't been much communication prior to that. And um, it also just allows for these um, short discussions, make sure everything is okay going into mediation. So I think, um, do you want me to go through answers for all the questions or, or how would you like it, Woody? Well, um, how about starting with uh, just a highlight of the concerns that some might have about online practice or training, and then we'll take a, take a little survey of the other rooms in the time that we have. All right. Um, okay, and, and, and by the way, best practice um, on, on the virtual training front um, was, you know, just making sure you've got, you've got something that you're, you're comfortable with um, in, in how you're presenting. And one of the things I discussed is I've got this set up. So I've got, I'm, I'm watching a, a big screen TV in front of me. I've got a camera on a tripod, two uh, studio lights, a, a rolling, um, a rolling uh, podium and a wireless mouse and, um, and keyboard. And, and that's, uh, that's something that's been helpful. So, and I think everybody needs to make sure the setting they have is comfortable for their training style. Um, so were there any concerns, um, Adam, that were brought up about uh, online practice or training in your sure. group? Uh, the digital divide, the fact that there's gonna be people who are very comfortable uh, with, um, with the technology. And there are gonna be some people regardless of how much you, you help and, and test it and do it, that they're just never going to be comfortable and many people in between. Um, so that was a, a concern that we be flexible enough to offer online services to those who are comfortable with, with it and flexible enough to accommodate those who just aren't. So I'll be back in a little while. Could you have an omelet ready, please? Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, well, next, let, let's go to Sam, and if we could um, find out in your room, what were some of the best uh, practices that were highlighted there? Sam, you need to unmute. So uh, thank you, intellectual integrity and modesty uh, propels me to say room two was the best looking and most intelligent of all of the groups that presented today. I think that goes without saying and bears repeating because we indicated that we still need to create a space in, in the virtual environment to ensure everyone be heard and involved authentically. And that includes keeping the experiential element of these particular um, meetings alive and well and not lose that. And I'll stop there. But I do have a screenshot of our group. It's to die for. I'll guess. So before we let you go, Sam, what were the best one best practice that might have been surfaced in your group? It, it is the absolute um, uh, doing the, a tech check with all the participants ahead of time and having a plan B when everything goes to hell in a handbasket in the forms of texts, phone calls, carrier pigeons, um, anything as the backup plan uh, when things go dead. Thank you very much. Um, Amy, in your group. So we had some similar discussions in our breakout room. So I'm just gonna touch on some things that had not um, been brought up thus far. Um, definitely the technology access was something that I know I've been taking for granted here in the US um, that a lot of areas don't <clears throat> have that. And so a couple of the really good points made in relation to that is that um, perhaps we could look at um, just because mediation has been done a certain way in the past in person, maybe we don't always need to replicate that exactly online and we should get a little bit more creative, um, maybe making mediations a little shorter and addressing a set amount of issues in one session so that when internet access is less or fatigue from being online so much is uh, bearing down on us that we could uh, shorten sessions and just have more of them. Uh, also, um, let's see here, um, I, in, uh, in Japan, it sounds like that they really are struggling to have online mediations. They're working on it, but 
that uh, they're doing things as simple as opening windows and using transparent barriers to still try to conduct um, some mediations live. I hope I've said that correctly. <laughs> um, but uh, in terms of biggest hopes going forward, I'm just going to throw that in there now, uh, is that we need to be able to go back and now reflect on all that we have learned and take uh, away from that uh, some things that will help us to find ways to make ourselves more accessible to more people, whether that's online or just being more creative even about how we meet with people in person. So, Thank you, Amy. Um, so Brian, in your room, what was some of the vision of, for the future, some of the hopes for online training and online practice? Well, we didn't talk too much about that, but I, I'll, I'll share with you what we did talk about, which was uh, the feeling that there's, it's a real challenge to be able to read people in the room. You can't, when you're working online, there's a, you know, a lack of uh, uh, body language to be interpreted. And that's a real drawback. Although I'll tell you, I just read a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Talking to Strangers, which really suggests we shouldn't rely so much on, on people's body language and, and uh, uh, to interpret what they're saying, which is, it's a fascinating read. I'd, I'd encourage uh, all mediators to, to uh, read that book, a uh, really good one. Malcolm Gladwell, Talking to Strangers. Um, but it's a challenge, you know, how do you, how do you design a process that uh, works for everyone? And how do you transition between sessions in a way that uh, keeps things moving forward and is, is um, uh, helpful to everyone? So that, those were some of the concerns and some of our pro professionals are new to the profession and they're concerned about how they're going to be able to uh, have opportunity to co-mediate and uh, shadow um, other mediators and um, so you know that's a that's a challenge we need to be able to uh, open the door for our new mediators to have those opportunities going forward even if we're still online some of the time I, I i was so impressed with our group i'm from canada we had some americans some someone from costa rica someone from the caribbean brazil and the united arab emirates so it was uh, um, uh, uh, I think uh, a, a really wonderful international uh, community of professionals. Brian, was there one takeaway as a best practice of what you do in, in um, online training uh, uh, as far as the group was concerned? Well, it, it was one question that came up is how do you get documents signed? And we talked about the use of various uh, um, processes. The one I use is called DocuSign, and uh, you send, um, uh, you upload your document to Document Sign, and you indicate where you want the signatures to go, and you put in your your client or whoever needs to sign the documents their email. They get the document, and uh, you can uh, just uh, um, bring it up on your computer. What we do is we go on Zoom. So that we can watch them actually press the button to in, insert their signatures so that we can attest to being a witness to it. Uh, and it's perfectly legal, at least in our jurisdiction, um, to sign it digitally like that. The document then comes back to me. Uh, we never print it. Uh, we send it uh, uh, all digitally uh, between our office to the, the other lawyer's office and so on. And it it works uh, very, very efficiently. So that's DocuSign. So one of the things that's happened in the last year is many jurisdictions have changed their laws. They didn't allow um, uh, uh, either notaries or signatures to be uh, online. And there's a lot of uh, change there uh, that um, all of us are benefiting from. Patty? You know, what we, I discovered the law had been in place in our jurisdiction for almost 20 years and nobody knew it. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, by the way, many people are now having clauses that you can put in your agreements to say you don't need a notary and it can and electronic signatures are fine. And those will become the new boilerplate of the future. Uh, Patty, in your room, what were some of the best practices that uh, you were able to exude? 
The, it was very similar to the other groups in terms of the online practitioner, that prep work was definitely increased um, doing those tech sheets. Someone had also mentioned uh, making sure attorneys get to their parties or clients information sheets or guidelines, a tip sheet uh, prior to mediation in terms of best practices for training. Um, I think that's been pretty much covered, but really uh, being able to use all the various tools that are available. Uh, one of the ladies talked about using polls to engage. So what are, what are the ways that we're engaging, but also engaging with them as human beings and not losing that human touch was really important to authentically show up and connect with people in, as best practice. Everything else was a, a ditto to everybody else. Oh, I'm going to go around with the uh, panel leaders that were in each group, and you will have um, up to 30 seconds to give what your vision is for the online future. And Patty, since I have you on the screen, why don't I start with you? I believe uh, one of the things that came out as a best hope for our group was uh, really embracing hybrid models uh, of practice, uh, whether that is in training or in the online practice. I, I'm a firm believer of ODR and very excited about where it's going to go in the future. And I'm going to be right on board with everyone learning. Good. Adam? Um, my, my biggest hope is, um, is opportunity. Um, I, I think that with online um, mediation or alternative dispute resolution, it's really opened up my practice so I can offer services to anybody around my state. And Florida is a pretty big state. So, um, so it's really allowed for such great opportunity. And I think uh, for, for others as well to expand and open their practices. Thank you, Adam. Amy. Thank you, Lee. Um, I think that I would love to see uh, online practices help us to improve um, access to justice in a lot of different ways as far as um, I myself wear hearing aids. And so uh, being able, I hope I, you know that those are always good enough, but uh, this has really forced me to take a closer look at accessibility for people. Um, and I also happen to be in a largely rural state. And I think that um, the, that if we, my state's fairly progressive with technology though. So um, in addition to having now, we have kiosks in all 99 of our courthouses that allow people to do their own filings. I hope we also start to see kiosks in private rooms that allow them to participate in things like mediation online um, and that our, our justice system can, can utilize technology in a whole host of ways to uh, improve access to justice. Sam. This came from one of our participants, Mariama uh, from Rio. Um, she indicated that, you know, there was so much resistance to going online initially, and we learned that it worked much better than our fears predicted. And perhaps we should take that lesson to the future as new technologies and new methodologies come online and, and be much more early adopters than we were initially. Thank you, Sam. And to wrap up the panel, but not our discussion totally, is Brian. Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, this pandemic was, has been all about us all staying apart, but in many ways it's brought us all together uh, through the use of technology. If it, if it weren't for Zoom, uh, we wouldn't all be in this, this uh, um, workshop together. And so, I, 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 that gives me hope that, that we can find new ways of using technology to help people and to bring people together uh, to uh, make it a better world. I'm, I'm very hopeful. So I'd like to finish this forum with a comment from Colin, who has really been the pioneer, uh, main, main pioneer of online uh, uh, modality long before the pandemic for decades. And to finish up with, uh, with having uh, it come um, from Jim Malamed, who has been an online uh, site for mediators for um, uh, now over three decades. First, Colin. And Colin had to step away for a second, but I feel like 
he would <laughs> say, this is all incredibly exciting. And the two phrases that I hear him say the most often about this, Jim, I think you'll laugh about both of these, that this reminds him of what his grandpa Pong Pong used to always say, that what we are starting to do is instead of just building the highway where the people are, that we are starting to build the highway where the people are going. So that's exciting that we are all starting to look towards what the next five, 10 years are going to look like and we are making steps in that direction. And the final thing you would say is that we are cooking with gas now. That seems to be his favorite Texas euphemism about this. Okay, now I'm so, passing it over to Jim. So Claire, you uh, you channeled Colin very that's right. Well, but you put yourself <laughs> right in there as well. I'm okay. trying to have a nice, smiley, innocent face. Does that kind of look like him? <laughs> <laughs> All right, if Jim, if you could uh, put a wrap on it and I wanna thank everyone for a very vibrant conversation see the um, video uh, and the chat, you'll get another um, uh, chance to see it again, just like on your DVR. Jim. Well, the, the other thing Colin, I think would have said is that uh, thinking about all this stuff way back when, literally 25 years and looking into the future is I said, you know, if, if you look forward, ADR, and ODR become the same. And, uh, and I think that that literally has become the case uh, under the pandemic circumstances. So just a few uh, pieces. Uh, I love Adam's word opportunity. I really think that's what is now before our dispute resolution uh, fields. And I'm, I'm not so sure it's so much about access to justice. Um, that would certainly be the essence of a court program. I like to think more about access to resolution uh, these days, because I think in so many of our collaborative process, it's the participants retaining full decision-making power that is ultimately the heart uh, and strength of the processes. Um, but you know, everything changed in March. Um, we still, I don't think, can fully wrap our head around this paradigm shift. Um, if there was a silver lining to uh, the pandemic, I think it is that we have uh, elevated and expanded our ability to effectively communicate online to resolve cases and to, to train. And we didn't do it so much because we wanted to, we just did it because there was no other option with this mass event. But I wanna highlight that while we were able to use Zoom and its analogs as kind of a face-to-face -face surrogate under the challenging circumstances of the pandemic. I do also wanna honor that there were 35 years of technical development before that, including, for example, getting people to get email addresses and learning what a website is and building their website and getting in directories and contact forms and payment and documents and, and all these other things, so much so that the infrastructure um, for getting the case and the infrastructure for processing the content and yielding an agreement was all pretty much in place. And we were able to swap in the Zoom surrogate. And now I think for the last year, we've been really learning with the Zoom context, how do we best use that? We can have the long meetings, more short meetings, nimble, tailored, strategic, uh, and the like. But the thing that is so exciting to me is our ability to serve more people, uh, to train more people, to do it more affordably, to do it more conveniently, to do it in an ongoing way. Uh, and just one of the great fortuities of all this online mediation and online training is it is so damn green. Nobody is getting into automobiles unless that's the only place they can get privacy you know, which is sometimes the case, but people aren't driving, they're not getting in traffic jams, they're not parking, they're not waiting in waiting rooms, at least uh, hopefully not physical uh, ones. And the we're not heating buildings, we're not cooling buildings, we're not having to pay unnecessary rent. All these things are ultimately resulting in more nimble, more affordable, more accessible services and training. And because of that convenience and because of that affordability, I actually think we use this as an opportunity to elevate and expand our training and education 
requirements. Minimally, core-based trainings need to be renovated to consider all the online aspects. Um, I think we could use with a 12 to 20 hour focused online mediation or online collaborative or online facilitative training. And most importantly, it's so darn easy for us to now have ongoing monthly or other webinars or ongoing professional cohort groups to make sure that we're staying current and building our professional uh, community as well. So the bottom line is I see this as a real renaissance for mediation. We're all about communication and we now have so many uh, options and opportunities and access to literally just about everybody on planet earth that we kind of have no excuses at this point for not uh, just vigilantly moving online facilitation, collaboration, mediation forward. So um, I'm super excited. Final little comment. Um, I know many mediators are saying, you know, I really don't need to go back. Um, I think I might just do the online. And that's great. And, and in fact, there was a survey done by Jeff Sharp that estimated about half the mediators in the civil commercial space were thinking along these lines. But more surprising, they also surveyed clients. And 70% of the clients indicated a preference for doing the cases online, the main driving force, convenience and affordability. So I think the world has changed. We thank you so very much for taking part in these forums. Please know we're all online. You can find us easily. Continue to send along your ideas. We will be in touch with you about the next forum as well as about the ultimate report and then the rollout of the report forum. So you're already on the list. We'll be in active touch. Thank you so very much for taking part.